Welcome back guys, uh, sorry for the delay. Now in this class we are going to continue with the central nervous system pathology. In last class we have discussed about the neurodegenerative disorders that is Alzheimer's disease as well as Syringo, uh, sorry Alzheimer's disease we have also discussed about Parkinsonism, Huntington's disease, Friedrich ataxia, these things we have discussed yesterday and also we have discussed about the basics, okay the basics in the central nervous system pathology. Now in this class let us discuss about different types of hemorrhages that occurs in the brain, okay the hemorrhages which are very very much important for your exams, FMG exam, PG exam and also for the board exams. This is a very important topic. First we will be discussing about the types of hemorrhages. Also we will be discussing about uh, meningitis today, hemorrhages, meningitis. Also we will be discussing about the prion diseases and finally we will be discussing about the CNS tumors. These four topics we have to discuss today. Okay. So having said that, without any further delay, now look at this. So this is the skull which I am showing you. Now what is this area sir? This is the weak area in the skull. Okay, where the four bones are meeting, the parietal bone, frontal bone, temporal bones, like you know all this. Okay, the four bones are meeting in this one single point, right? So, these four bones are the frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, zygomatic bone. So, these four bones are meeting in that one single point. So, this point is called as a terion. Okay, that the point is called as what? Terion, sir. Okay, that's a point called as a terion. Now, Look here, just remember that one point that it's called as a terion. Now, next. So, what you are seeing here, these are the layers from outside. This is the scalp. Okay, this is the scalp, that's the skin. Let's take it as a skin. Now, here, this is the bone. Okay, this is the bone, the skull bone. Okay, that's the skull bone. Now, down to the skull bone, what do we have? Here is the brain material. Okay, here is the brain. Now, brain is covered by what? So, brain it is covered by meninges. Okay, brain is covered by meninges. What are the meninges? Three, there are three meninges. First one is dura matter. Okay, dura matter. Next, there is a web-like membrane which is called as arachnoid in which the uh, uh, TSF is flowing. Next, down to it, there is pia matter. So, there is a dura matter, arachnoid matter and pia matter. Dura, arachnoid and pia. Okay. D-E-A-T. Dura, arachnoid and pia matter. Now, my question is, look at the dura. Okay, look at the dura. So, the dura is divided into two layers. Dura is divided into two layers. One is periosteal layer which is attached to the bone. Okay, one is periosteal layer. Next layer, it is called as a meningeal layer. Okay, so periosteal layer and meningeal dura. Periosteal dura and meningeal dura, there are two types of dura. Okay, two layers, I should say that there are two layers of dura. Okay, done. Having said that, now let me discuss with you what are the different types of hemorrhages. The first type of hemorrhage which I want you to know for your exam is called as a epi. Ural hemorrhage. Okay, AP means above, above the dura matter, above the dura matter, there is hemorrhage occurring. So that is called as epidural hemorrhage. So why epidural hemorrhage, sir? Why it will occur? How it will look like on the CT? See, epidural hemorrhage, whenever the person is having a trauma, okay. Now imagine there is this one guy who is playing, who is playing some sport cricket or he is having some accident, this guy is having this accident. Because of that, now he is having trauma, especially in the area of the terion. In this area, the terion, now there is a trauma, when there is a blow injury. Now, whenever there is a trauma to the area of the terion, just below the, to the terion, imagine for example, this is the terion. Now, below to the terion, there is an artery present, which is called as a menin, middle meningeal artery, MMA. Middle meningeal artery is present. So, this artery is going to be ruptured. Okay, this artery is going to be affected. Whenever the terion is affected, the artery is going to be affected. Now, when this artery is affected, meninge meninge artery, that is going to bleed. Okay, now there is going to be bleeding. So, where that bleeding is occurring, that bleeding will occur, occur, the bleeding will occur above the dura matter. So, this is called as a epidural hemorrhage. Epi means above the dura matter, there is hemorrhage occurring. So, now when it will occur, epidural hemorrhage, trauma to the region. Which region? Trauma to a region called as terion. Okay, so what is the artery that is going to be affected? The artery that is affected is middle meningeal artery. Now, see if a patient is having this epidural hemorrhage, imagine there is this one guy who is going on a bike. Now, he had an accident and he is having a trauma to the region of terion. Now, middle meningeal artery is ruptured. Now, whenever he is having an accident, immediately he is going to go into unconscious. Now, he has gone into unconsciousness. Okay, because of sudden trauma, he got into unconsciousness. Now, there is a hemorrhage that started happening in the brain. Okay, hemorrhage have started. Now, he will regain his consciousness. Like, you know, the surrounding people will help him to get back to his consciousness. Now, he is conscious. But still, there is hemorrhage happening in the brain. He doesn't know that there is a hemorrhage. 
okay now this patient become conscious and now he went to the home now because of this hemorrhage that's whatever is happening so hemorrhage 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 blood is accumulating that will lead to the formation of hematoma what that hematoma will do hematoma increases the intracranial pressure okay so hemorrhage happening happening happen it compresses the brain tissue actually he will go into shock and he will go into coma okay he will go into coma sir so first there is a period of unconsciousness okay the first there is a period of unconsciousness again he will become conscious okay he will become conscious again he will went into the unconsciousness okay again conscious and he will die so this period of the period of consciousness the period of consciousness which is present between two unconsciousness okay there is a slight period where the patient can be still conscious so this period is called as lucid interval okay this period is called as lucid interval okay so lucid interval it is seen with which type of hemorrhage epidural hemorrhage what is lucid hemorrhage after the trauma for the transient period of time for a little amount of time the patient will become unconscious later he will become conscious now he is doing normal his work he is he get back to his home and he is doing normal work suddenly he will become unconscious and he will die so this period of consciousness which is present between these two unconscious states it's called as lucid interval a lucid interval so okay in this uh, epidural hemorrhage whenever there is epidural hemorrhage now what if the patient instead of going he is a little educated person imagine he is a medico instead of going to the home he knows so there is a hemorrhage there is a trauma that have happened to this region of the skull okay tyrion the tyrion might have damaged and middle meningeal artery might have damaged so instead of going to the home he is coming to the hospital he ask for the say i had this accident just go for the ct okay ct head now whenever you do the uh, ct scan how the hemorrhage is going to look like so the hemorrhage is going to look like lens shaped hemorrhage it is how it is okay, it is in the form of a lens shape okay by convex okay like a convex so by convex so by convex shape this is lens shape hemorrhage okay by convex so this is a classical question that will be coming in your exam of a patient who is having the epidural hemorrhage the patient is going to have lens shaped hemorrhage that is appreciated on the ct now okay there is hemorrhage happening sir now what you have to do immediately immediately you have to put a hole here okay you have to put a hole and you have to drain this hemorrhage or the hematoma you have to drain it otherwise what happens the brain is getting compressed and the brain will become herniated or that will actually kill the patient that will actually kill the patient okay intracranial pressure increases the herniation of brain will occur that can lead to the death so you have to put the holes and you have to remove that blood which is accumulating over there so this is called as bur hole surgery what is the surgery that is performed see you are putting the holes filling the holes and removing the removing the hematoma so this is a bur hole surgery okay the bur hole surgery is done for epidural hematomas now after this let's discuss about the other type of hemorrhage the second type of hemorrhage bur hole surgery one important point i want you to know apart from that on ct on ct what is seen lens shaped hemorrhage Okay, lens shaped hemorrhage is seen. The second type of hemorrhage that I want you to know is called as a subdural hemorrhage. So, what is this subdural hemorrhage, and in which patients it will occur? See, epidural hemorrhages are usually seen with blow trauma. Okay, traumas. The subdural hemorrhages are seen in old patients, or it can be seen even in children. See extremes of the age, either old patients or children. Why? See, whenever there is a sudden decelerating injury, actually, see in the subdural space. Okay, in the subdural space means below the dura. Okay, below the dura. I am talking about the subdural space. See, in the subdural space, there are veins called as. Let me write here. In the subdural space, there are veins which are present. There are draining veins which are called as the bridging veins. this bridging veins are present okay this bridging veins are present now whenever there is a sudden decelerating injury sudden decelerating injury now imagine you are going in a car now when you suddenly apply the brakes okay when you do so do you know what happens this bridging veins they will be damaged the bridging veins are going to be damaged okay and for example you take a baby okay when you take a baby and when you suddenly shake this baby okay suddenly shake this baby that will also cause trauma to this bridging veins that can also cause trauma to this bridging veins 
whenever the these veins are damaged again there is going to be hemorrhage into the brain where into the subdural space so this is called as a subdural hemorrhage okay this is called as what this is called as a subdural hemorrhage okay so older patients children is also important it is also seen in alcoholics okay alcoholics okay so these are the important points which i want you to know subdural hemorrhage is seen in old patients children alcoholics whenever there is a sudden decelerating injury that will cause a damage to the bridging veins so hemorrhage will occur so how the hemorrhage is going to look like Sir, is it a deadly hemorrhage? See, epidural hemorrhage is a deadly hemorrhage right? because in epidural hemorrhage, the blood vessel which is involved in is a middle meningeal artery. It's an arterial bleeding. So, as it's an arterial bleeding, the patient is going to have severe symptoms. Okay, the patient can even die within a few, uh, like, you know, hearts. Now, in uh, subdural hemorrhage, in subdural hemorrhage, what is happening? So, it's the veins that are rupturing. It's the small, small veins that are rupturing. When the veins are ruptured, the bleeding is going to be little passive, slowly, slowly, slowly. So, it takes months to show the symptoms also. Okay, it's a little light bleeding. So, epidural hemorrhage is more dangerous when compared to the subdural hemorrhages. Okay. So, how the hemorrhage is going to look like on the CT? See, in the CT, look here. Here, the patient, here, this white area. Okay, white areas are the hemorrhages. Okay, see, this white area. How it is looking like? It's almost looking like a crescent, right? It almost looks like a crescent. The moon, the crescent. So, crescent shaped hemorrhages are seen with subdural hemorrhage. In subdural hemorrhage, there are crescent shaped hemorrhages. So, done. Now, after this, what else I should teach you? The last type of uh, hemorrhage. Let me uh, add a slide and let me teach you. See, the last type of hemorrhage is called as subarachnoidal hemorrhage. Subarachnoidal hemorrhage. See, so when it will happen, sir, the subarachnoidal hemorrhage? See, the subarachnoidal hemorrhages usually seen in patients who are having very aneurysms. So, in the circular villus, you know, in the circular villus, there can be aneurysms, very aneurysms. Okay, saccular aneurysms are very aneurysms. Now, if there is the rupture, okay, rupture. Of this berry aneurysm. Okay, there is a rupture of berry aneurysm. What happens? That causes subarachnoidal hemorrhage. Now, whenever the patient is having the subarachnoidal hemorrhage, the patient is going to have severe headache. Severe headache. Okay. He will say that this is the worst headache in his entire life. So these headaches are called as thunderclap headache. Okay, so thunderclap headache. Now, see the berry aneurysms are rupturing. Okay, now where is the hemorrhage? Hemorrhage is in the subarachnoidal space. Now, the hemorrhage is happening in the subarachnoidal space. Now, subarachnoidal space is filled with CSF. No, okay, CSF. There is CSF in the subarachnoidal space. Now, there is hemorrhage that is happening into the CSF. Now, there is hemorrhage that is happening into the CSF. Okay, so whenever you do the lumbar puncture, Okay, whenever you do the lumbar puncture, what you will see on our lumbar puncture? Okay, you take the fluid. Normally, the CSF is going to be clear fluid, right? It's going to be clear fluid. Now, you can see this red color in the CSF because of the hemorrhage that is happening into the subarachnoidal space. In the subarachnoidal space, there is CSF present. That CSF, now it's, it's a continuous thing, right? That CSF is also going to enter into the spinal cord. Okay, so whenever you do the lumbar puncture, you can see red color fluid. Okay, that is oozing out. So, subarachnoidal hemorrhages are because of the rupture of berry aneurysms. The patient is going to experience a severe headache, which is called as a thunderclap headache. Whenever you do the lumbar puncture, you can see RBCs. Okay, the red, red color. If you put it under the microscope, then you can see the RBCs. Okay. Next, what else I want you to know is, see, what are the complications that are seen? Okay, now, okay, sir, look at this. Herniations. Now, imagine there is a, hemorrhage that is happening. For example, here the hemorrhage is lens shaped. So, it is epidural hemorrhage. Now, there is an epidural hemorrhage. Now, there is an epidural hemorrhage. Now, the brain is getting compressed, right? Now, the brain is getting compressed. So, that will cause what? Herniation. Herniation. Herniation means the tissue is now getting protruded into the other place. Now, 
that is why see this lobe of the brain this lobe which is inside the lobe these lobes of the brain which are called as the uncle lobes okay these are the uncle hemispheres now because of this epidural hematoma intracranial pressure increases intracranial pressure increases because of the increase in the intracranial pressure the pressure is more sir now it will compress the brain it will push the brain wherever possible so this uncle lobe it is getting herniated see so this is called as uncle herniation very important mcq so this is one of the important complication so there are different types of uh, herniation see if one hemisphere for example see the third one so what exactly is the third one subfall seen herniation if this lobe if it is protruding into this side one lobe is protruding into the other side then it is called as a subfall seen herniation there can be subfall seen herniation okay uncle herniation transtentorial herniation different types are there but what the important one which, which i want you to know is this one this is called as a uncle herniation the uncle herniation or transtentorial herniation now whenever this uncle herniation occurs see in uncle herniation epidural hemorrhage intracranial pressure increases uncle herniation look here what you need to understand is so what is this part can you tell me so this is the midbrain right the first part this is the midbrain down to the midbrain what do you have you have pons here medulla now i hope you already know that from the, the from the midbrain from the midbrain which cranial nerves will come out from the midbrain third cranial nerve will come out the oculomotor nerve will come out so because of this uncle herniation the third cranial nerve is going to be affected okay the third cranial nerve is damaged as a third cranial nerve is damaged what are the symptoms that are seen look in uncle herniation which cranial nerve is affected it's a third cranial nerve oculomotor nerve palsy is seen when the oculomotor nerve for example hemorrhage is happening this side and the third cranial nerve is getting affected this side whenever there is a hemorrhage happening the third cranial nerve is affected because the third cranial nerve is affected see the patient is going to have down and outward movement of the eye down and outward now the eye is going to look down and outward down and outward deflection will be seen with the third cranial nerve palsy third cranial nerve is a parasympathetic nerve 3 7 9 10 are parasympathetic nerves third cranial nerve is a parasympathetic nerve now the parasympathetic innervation to the eye is gone third cranial nerve gives the parasympathetic innervation to the eye as the third cranial nerve is damaged the parasympathetic innervation is gone when the parasympathetic innervation is gone what happens there will be pupillo dilation pupillo constriction is a parasympathetic activity when the parasympathetic activity is gone more dominant sympathetic activity so there will be pupillo dilation okay so look here the patient the downward and outward gaze downward and outward gaze and you can also see dilated pupil okay dilated pupil okay. so these are the important points which I want you to know. In uncle herniation, third cranial nerve is affected. Oculomotor nerve palsy is seen where the patient is going to have downward, outward deflection of the eye with dilation of the pupil or the midriasis. Dilation of the pupil or midriasis. Okay. So, what are the important points? Just a recap. Okay. Just a recap. See how many types of hemorrhages are there? Epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, subarachnoidal hemorrhage. In epidural hemorrhage, middle meningeal artery is affected. In subdural hemorrhage, bridging veins are affected. In subarachnoidal hemorrhage, there is rupture of berry aneurysms. Which hemorrhage presents with lucid interval epidural hemorrhage? Which hemorrhage can be there for a long time? Subarachnoidal hemorrhage. Which hemorrhage is going to present with a severe headache? Hunter cap headache. That is subarachnoidal hemorrhage. Okay, subarachnoidal hemorrhage. If there is epidural hemorrhage or any form of hemorrhage, doesn't matter. There is a risk of herniations. If the uncle lobe, if it is herniating, see the uncle lobe is herniating onto what? It herniates onto the midbrain where the third cranial nerve will be affected. That will lead to oculomotor nerve palsy. Okay, the eye is going to show down and outward gaze with the midriasis done. So, with this, it is completed. Okay. So, herniation, the important topic I have explained you. Uh, after this, the herniation, the complication I have explained you. After this, the next topic which I want to discuss is called as a prion diseases. Okay, prion diseases. Now, what exactly are these prion diseases, sir? Okay, prion diseases. See, these are proteopathies, guys. Remember, these are a type of, let me write here. They are the type of proteopathies. Means protein-related problem. Okay, protein-related problem. Here in this condition, there is uh, this structurally misfolded protein. Now, this protein will act as an infectious particle. When you get into contact with such a protein, 
now you will get the disease okay now i will explain you so prion diseases it's a type of proteopathy or you can say disease of structurally abnormal proteins disease of it's a disease of structurally abnormal proteins see these patients okay these patients with the prions disease are going to have progressive dementia okay so progressive dementia because they are going to have the longer incubation periods okay long time it will take a lot of time okay longer incubation periods longer incubation period okay see what exactly happens in this prions disease is so there is this abnormal protein okay there is this abnormal protein now this abnormal protein it's acting like an infectious particle how it is acting like an infectious particle i will explain you so there is this abnormal protein okay now it is the infectious particle okay so there is no dna no rna nothing is present okay it's just a protein particle it's just a protein thing it's just only a protein there is no dna no rna no cell membrane nothing it's just a protein it is going to be infective to you me everyone who is getting into contact with that particle now that person will be affected okay so infectious particle is a protein see how you will how one can get this for example so what are the types okay what are the types the types are familial you can get it like you know within the family like families familial or it can be sporadic means it can occur in anyone or it can be infectious also familial means within the families like you know coming from one generation to other generation sporadic means generally something like that or infectious means from one person to other person what are the roots of infection roots of infection how one can get this for example iatrogenic okay iatrogenic for example when a person is undergoing corneal transplant imagine that there is this one person who is getting a corneal transplant from some other person now that other person is having this prion disease now if you are getting a transplant by transplant also one can get so corneal transplants okay by corneal transplant one can get this diseases prion diseases now what is the pathogenesis sir what exactly is happening so you are telling that it's a protein particle it is infectious in nature prolonged incubation periods are seen see what is the pathogenesis let me tell you the pathogenesis is there is this one protein which is present in you and me in everyone there is this one protein which is called as prpc okay so this prpc it's a protein which is having alpha helix the structure is this alpha helix okay it's having an alpha helix okay the three dimensional structure is alpha helix structure prpc this is normal now if this prpc now it is converting into prpsc different type okay the same protein now it became prpsc so why sir see while this protein is forming while this protein when it is forming instead of having this alpha helical structure now it is having beta pleated form now it is having beta pleated form so this beta pleated form now it cannot be degraded in the body normally proteins will be de degraded right the proteins the older proteins will be usually degraded proteolysis will occur but when you have such a kind of protein prpsc this prpsc now it cannot be degraded cannot be degraded it is resistant to degradation prpsc now what happens so this prpsc it start to accumulate in the brain accumulate in brain and what it will cause it will cause brain damage 
Okay, so it's causing brain damage. If you look at the brain, in the brain you are going to see large vacuoles, large vacuoles inside the neurons. Okay, so because of this accumulation of this PRPSC, this is the culprit, the PRPSC, the protein. It's, a, it's actually a protein which is in a beta pleated form. So it's caused, it started to cause a damage to the brain. So vacuoles, lots and lots of vacuoles will be seen in the brain. So that's why this disease is called as spongy form. Like you know, now the brain is looking like a sponge. Now the brain is looking like a sponge with multiple, multiple small, small holes. So spongy form encephalopathy. Spongy form encephalopathy. Okay, so that's why this Priyan's disease is also called as spongy form encephalopathy. You can say transmissible. Actually, this is also called as transmissible spongy form encephalopathy. Why? Because I have said you, whoever get into contact with this protein, now this protein it will come into the body. Now, once this protein enters into the body, it will convert the normal PRPC into PRPSC. Now, it have entered into the body. Now, it will convert whenever, see, my PRPC, for example, I am the person who is having PRPC. Normal thing. When this PRPSC, when it comes into the body, now this PRPSC will convert this PRPC into PRPSC. It's like, it's like a chain reaction, chain reaction. Okay. So, this PRPSC, when it comes into contact with PRPC, protein. Now, this PRPC will be converted into again PRPSC. So, in this way, it is contagious, means it is transmitted from one person to other person, causing spongy form encephalopathy, causing holes in the brain. So, that's why it's called as a transmissible spongy form encephalopathy. Okay, Priyan disease is also called as, you should know, Priyan disease is also called as transmissible spongy form encephalopathy. If you look at here, see this is, look, these are the holes. Okay, these are the small, 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 small vacuoles. So that's why it is called as a transmissible spongy form encephalopathy. Okay, the prionis is also called as sible spongy form encephalopathy. Now, what are the diseases, sir? See, this prion's diseases include. It includes which disease? The same thing will happen. So there is a disease called as Creutzfeldt. Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. The Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. The second disease is called as familial, fatal, insomnia, Kuru disease. Next, bovine spongy form encephalopathy. Okay, bovine spongy form encephalopathy and scrappy disease. And mink disease. See, all these are the prion diseases. Sir. In all these diseases, the same thing happening. It, these are all the same diseases, but different, different types of symptoms. Symptoms will be little different. So, all these are the examples of the prion diseases. Okay. So, crucial Jacobs disease, Bowen's spongy form encephalopathy, Minx disease, Kuru's disease, okay, Scrappy's disease, familial fatal insomnia. All these are the examples of prion diseases. Okay. Now, sir, one important MCQ. Yes, all of them are going to affect the brain. But one disease is not going to show the spongy form appearance, MCQ, spongy form appearance. In brain is not seen with, the spongy form appearance in the brain is not seen with which disease? Familial, fatal, insomnia. Okay, so the familial fatal insomnia, it's a, yes, it's a prion disease, but there the spongy form appearance of the brain is not seen. The only important points which I want you to know is, sir, in prion's diseases, prion's diseases are due to proteins. Protein is the infectious particle. Whenever this protein, this, uh, this protein, which is a misfolded protein in the beta configurated form, whenever it is coming into contact with the healthy proteins, even the healthy proteins will be converted into PRP-SC form. So, it's like a chain reaction and affecting the entire brain. 
This PRPC is a normal protein which is present in the brain will be converted into PRPSC. This is just include, I gave you the list. Okay. So done, sir. Next, after this, what else I should teach you? So next, discuss about the meningitis, sir. We'll discuss about meningitis. First. Let me discuss about the meningitis here. So what is meningitis? You know meninges means GR matter, arachnoid matter and matter. The meninges are getting inflamed. Okay, the meninges are getting inflamed. So why they are getting inflamed? Why? Because of infection. There is infection with the meninges leading to the inflammation. So what are the most common organisms? See, the most common organisms are going to be group B streptococci. Okay, the group B strept streptococci. So group B streptococci, streptococcus. Okay, group B streptococcus is the uh, one of the most common organism causing meningitis. Apart from this, E. coli. Next, Listeria. Okay, Listeria monocytogens, especially in the neonates. Okay, especially in the neonates. So there are other organisms like Listeria meningitis. The name itself is there, meningitis. So this Neisseria meningitis is going to cause uh, mening uh, meningitis, especially in children and teenagers. Children and teenagers. Okay. So in adults, sir, in adults, what is the most common organism that's causing the meningitis? It is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay, Streptococcus pneumoniae is going to cause the meningitis, especially in the Adults, uh, questions can ask something like in a non-vaccinated individuals, the persons who are not a vac, uh, who, are, who haven't got this vaccination, in non-vaccinated people, what is the most common cause of this meningitis? It is Haemophilus influenza. So Haemophilus influenza is going to cause meningitis in non-vaccinated people. Uh, in a patient who is having immunocompromised state, okay, the patient is having immunosuppression. See, in a patient who is having immunosuppression, in this patient, so usually they will get meningitis because of even fungi. Usually, we won't get any infection with the fungi. Usually, our ha we are having a, a potent immune system which can tightly regulate the fungal growth. But in a patient who is having this immunosuppression or immunocompromised patients like HIV patients, okay, or diabetic patients or OCP users, now they can get even Infection with the fungi. Fungi can lead to the meningitis. So the, I gave you different different causes of the meningitis. Group B streptococcus. In adults, usually in adults, the most common cause of meningitis is streptococcus pneumoniae. In children, it is Neisseria meningitis. Children and uh, teenagers. In adults, streptococcus pneumoniae. In non-vaccinated individuals, Haemophilus influenza. Okay, in immunosuppressed patients, um, it is fungi. Okay, done sir. Now, what are the trial? of symptoms that is seen in meningitis. Imagine the, now there is this one person who is having meningitis. Now imagine there is this one person who is having meningitis. What are the three symptoms that are going to be seen? The three symptoms are going to be, first headache is going to be there, fever is going to be there and nuchal rigidity, stiffness in the neck, stiffness in the neck. Because of the inflammation in the meninges, he cannot easily move his head because whenever he is moving his head, the meninges are also going to be stretched that causes a severe headache, a severe pain. Okay, so the three symptoms which are seen are fever, headache and nuchal rigidity. Fever, headache and nuchal rigidity. Now what are the two signs? Okay, what are the two signs that are seen in a patient who is having meningitis? Okay, imagine that I am coming to you and you are suspecting that I am having meningitis. Now if you do certain physical examination, two signs will be positive. What are they? That is the Kernig sign and the Brzezinski sign. The Kernig sign and the Brzezinski sign are going to be positive. So what is this Kernig sign? Sir, Kernig sign means pain in the hamstring muscles, in the leg. Okay, pain in the leg, hamstring muscles, when trying to straighten the legs with flexed hips. Now, imagine the person is like this. Okay, the person is lying, completely lying. Now, he have flexed his hips. Now, first he have flexed his hips. Now, after, for example, imagine this is the person lying like this. Now, first he flexed his lips, uh, not uh, the, sir, not the lips, hips. Okay, there is flexing of the hips. After flexing the hips, now he is trying to straighten the legs. So then he is going to have pain in the 
hamstring muscles. Now let me show you here. See with the flexed hips. Now when you try to do the straightening of the legs, he is going to have pain. So that is called as a Kernick sign. After Kernick sign. What is the next sign? It is a Brzezinski sign. So what is Brzezinski sign? Brzezinski sign is whenever you see it is a passive, passive neck flexion resulting in flexion of the hips and knees. Now the patient, see here the patient is lying down like this. Now when this patient, when you try to flex his neck, when you, when he, you try to flex his neck, automatically there is flexion in his hips and knees. The hips and knees are going to flex. See, the hips are flexing and also the knees are also flexing. Okay, uh, this is, sign is called as the Brzezinski sign. Okay, why? Why? Because this is because of inflammation in the meninges. Inflammation in the meninges is resulting in this sign. So, the two important MCQs here are what are the triad of symptoms. The triad of symptoms are going to be fever, nuchal rigidity and headache. Fever, nuchal rigidity and headache. And what are the two signs that are positive in the meninges? It is a Kernick sign and Brzezinski sign. Kernick sign is flexing the hips. The, the hips are flexing instead. And when you try to when you try to extend the legs, okay, trying to straighten the legs. Now, the legs, see, after flexing the hips, when you try to straighten the legs or extend the legs, something like this, so it's going to cause a pain. And Brzezinski sign, I have explained to you. Flexing the neck automatically causes the flexion in the hips and knees. Okay, so that's the Brzezinski sign. So, two signs completed. Now, after this, how to establish the diagnosis, sir? See, meningitis can be because of bacteria. I have shown you different different types of bacteria that is causing meningitis. Streptococcus pneumoniae can cause. Okay. So, streptococcus pneumoniae can cause. E. coli can cause. Listeria monocytogens can cause. Even virus can cause, sir. Okay. Even virus can cause the uh, meningitis, especially Coxsackie virus. Okay. Coxsackie virus via the fecoviral route. The Coxsackie virus can even cause the meningitis, especially in children. It comes via the fecoviral route. Coxsackie virus. Even fungi can cause. Fungal meningitis. So, though, there can be bacterial meningitis. There can be viral meningitis or fungal meningitis. So, how to know? Now, a patient came to my clinic. Okay, a small 10-year-old guy or 15-year-old guy, he came to my clinic. And he's having fever, headache and he's saying, Sir, I cannot move my neck. There is a nuchal rigidity. So, I suspected that uh, this fellow is having meningitis. Now, meningitis can be bacteria, can be, can be because of virus, can be because of fungus. How to differentiate? See, how to differentiate is, if it is bacterial meningitis, look here, if it is bacterial meningitis, what happens is, in the CSF, I am talking about the CSF, okay. Now, what happens is, see the WBC's count will be increased, okay, the WBC's count, okay, the WBC count, see it will be in the range of 1000 to 2000, okay, more, more WBC's, especially neutrophils, okay. So, neutrophil number increases, neutrophils, lots and lots of neutrophils, if it is a bacterial meningitis, the number of neutrophils will increase in the cerebrospinal fluid, in the CSF, okay. Now, I just make a lumbar puncture. I just got the CSF. In the CSF, more number of neutrophils are there means, I can say, it's a bacterial meningitis. See, one more important point is, yes, in fungal meningitis also, normal, see, the normal number of cells will be less than 8. But in bacterial meningitis, see, it is 1000, 1000 to 2000. In fungal meningitis also, the number of WBC increases, the number of neutrophils increases, but it won't exceed more than 500. It won't exceed more than 500. Okay. If you see more number of WBCs in the cerebrospinal fluid, yes, it is bacterial meningitis. If the number, yes, WBCs are increased, but less than 500 is fungal meningitis. If it is viral meningitis, it's not the neutrophils that are going to increase. It's not the neutrophils that will increase. Sir, lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are going to be predominant in number. Lymphocyte predominance is seen in viral meningitis. But in bacterial meningitis and fungal meningitis, it is the neutrophil predominance. Neutrophil predominance is being. So, based on this, you can put the differentiation. What else? What else? See, bacteria and fungus. See, both bacteria and fungus, will they take glucose or not for their growth? For their growth, they will use the glucose. So, in the CSF, the normal level of glucose is 50 to 80, okay, milligrams per deciliter, 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter, normal range. In bacterial meningitis, see, it is less than 14, 
is coming less than 40. So, in bacterial meningitis, the CSF glucose levels will go down. And even sometimes in fungal meningitis also, there can be low glucose levels. But very important, in viral meningitis, the glucose levels will be normal. The glucose levels, most of the time, most of the time in bacterial meningitis and fungal meningitis, the glucose levels will go down. But in viral meningitis, the glucose levels will be constant. Okay, glucose levels will be constant. So, based on glucose, you can differentiate viral meningitis from other two types of meningitis. Based on the type of WBC, you can differentiate bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis and fungal meningitis and number of WBC. Based on the number and type, you can differentiate whether it is bacterial or whether it is fungal or whether it is viral. And protein, how to differentiate the meningitis, the cause of meningitis based on the protein. So, usually the protein in the CSF is between 15 to 45 milligrams per deciliter, 15 to 45. Look in bacterial meningitis, the protein content is increasing, okay, protein content. So, bacterial meningitis as well as fungal meningitis also, proteins will increase in the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. But in viral meningitis, the proteins will be less than 200, so which means normally is 15 to 45. But in all types of meningitis, it increases. All types of meningitis, the protein levels increases. In bacterial and fungal, usually the value will be more than 200. In viral meningitis, the value will be less than 200. Okay, less than 200 sir. Okay, so these three columns are important. These three columns. Okay, these are the three important things which uh, you, we, by which you can differentiate the type of meningitis. Now after this, okay, so just try to answer these things in bacterial meningitis and fungal meningitis differentiation. Okay, in bacterial meningitis and fungal meningitis, CSF glucose levels. Bacterial and fungal CSF glucose levels are less. Okay, CSF glucose levels are less. In viral meningitis, CSF glucose levels are, in viral, virus does not use any glucose, so normal, it will be normal. In bacterial meningitis, CSF have, in bacterial type of meningitis, CSF have neutrophils, neutrophils, more than 2000, more than 2000 in number. In fungal meningitis, CSF have, in fungal, fungal meningitis, yes, CSF have, Neutrophils again, neutrophils only, but, let the, but less than 500, but less than 500. In fungal meningitis, there is neutrophils, neutrophils less than 500, here is a typing mistake. Okay, in fungal meningitis, yes, neutrophils will be there, but less than 500. Okay. In viral meningitis, lymphocytes will be there. Okay, done. So, meningitis, done. The important point is the triad, headache, fever, nuchal rigidity. Two signs, Kernick sign, Dusinski sign. How to differentiate this table? Bacterial, viral and fungal. How to differentiate? Done. And what are the causative organisms? The causative organisms, different, different people, age groups and different, different thing. Okay. In children, the most common virus, the most common virus, okay, the virus to cause meningitis in children is going to be coxsackie. Okay. The coxsackie virus, coxsackie virus. Now, after this, what else I should teach you? Now, preanus is completed, meningitis is completed, okay, hemorrhage is also completed. Now, let me teach you CNS tumors, okay, tumors in the central nervous system. See, what are the different types of tumors that are present? Okay, first you should know what are the different types of tumors, sir. Okay, look. Let me write here. Yeah. Most common tumors in central nervous system. The most common tumors in the central nervous system. The most common tumors are not arising in the brain, sir. Okay. Usually neurons they won't cause any tumor, won't cause any cancer. See, the most common tumors are always secondaries. That is metastasis. Okay, metastasis. From where? Metastasis from lung. Okay, lung cancer. That is small cell carcinoma of the lung. Small cell or oat cell. Now, we have discussed this. Okay, the oat cell carcinoma, the small cell carcinoma. Okay, worst prognosis in the lung, in the, in the chapter of the lung. So, so, central nervous system tumors, the most common central nervous system tumors are secondaries and due to metastasis. Now, what are the primary tumors then? The primary tumors are glial tumors. Glial tumors. Sir, what are these glial tumors if you ask me? See, there are glial cells, astrocytes, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, 
Schwann cells. These are all the glial cells, right? Supporting cells. If they develop tumor, if they develop tumor, where is the tumor in the brain? They are the primary tumors. So, they are the glial tumors. So, astrocytoma. So, astrocytoma is a tumor of astrocytes. Next, oligo. Dendroglioma. Okay, oligodendrocytes, tumor of oligodendrocytes. There can be ependymoma. There can be schwannoma. Okay, schwannoma. So, these are the different types of glial tumors. Okay, different types of glial cells. If they get a tumor, different types of glial tumors. Now, astrocytoma, here itself I am telling you, there are two types of astrocytoma, which are called as a pilocytic. Pilocytic astrocytoma and the second variety, the most like you know dangerous one, the serious one, it is glioblastoma multiforme. Glioblastoma multiforme. So, pilocytic astrocytoma or glioblastoma multiforme, both are what? They are both are the tumors of astrocytes. Both are the tumors of astrocytes. Oligodendroglioma is a tumor of oligodendrocytes, which cause the myelination. Ependymoma is a tumor of ependymal cells, which are the lining cells. Okay. And schwannoma is a tumor of schwann cells, which will also cause the myelination in the peripheral nervous system. Having said that, now let's begin with pilocytic astrocytoma. So this pilocytic astrocytoma, it is seen in which age group? Children. Okay. So the pilocytic astrocytoma, it is seen in children, sir. Children. Okay. Now, look at this and tell me. So, look at this first MRI and tell me, sir, where exactly is the tumor present? So, the tumor, it is present, it's a cystic dilated nodule, it's a cystic tumor, okay? Where it is present? In the cerebellum, okay, in the cerebellum. So, pilocytic astrocytoma, it is going to be seen in cerebellum, sir. First of all, what it is? It is cystic tumor, not a solid tumor, it's a cystic tumor with mural. Mural means wall, mural nodule. Okay, so basically remember one point, it's a cystic tumor, seen in the children and next one is seen in cerebellum. Cerebellum, sir. Okay, see, pilocytic astrocytoma, everything is, is the C, children, C, cystic tumor, C, cerebellum is affected, there is a tumor in the cerebellum. Okay, there is a tumor in the cerebellum. Now, why, why pil pilocytic astrocytoma, why it is occurring here, sir? Gene mutations, which gene mutations? BRAF, BRAF mutation, BRAF fusion actually, there is fusion, this BRAF gene fusion is going to be seen. Next, what else? Look here, see this is the cerebellum where you can see this cystic nodule, okay, the cystic tumor with a mural nodule, cystic tumor with a mural nodule, okay, the cystic tumor with a mural nodule is seen. Next, one more thing. Here also, cystic tumor with a mural nodule. Okay. See, pilocytic astrocytoma, section of cerebellum. Okay. Showing a cystic neoplasm with a mural nodule. Next, what else? Look at this diagram and tell me. Sir, in the SGS class, in the basics, in the CNS basics, I have explained you. Sir, Rosenthal fibers. Are you able to remember? Rosenthal fibers made up of heat shock protein 27 and ubiquitin. Okay, Rosenthal fibers, seen with astrocyte injuries. Okay, so in this condition, pilocytic astrocytoma, what is present? Rosenthal fibers. Okay, in the astrocytes, Rosenthal fibers are present. Okay, when you take the biopsy, when you put it under the microscope, what you will see is Rosenthal fibers. Okay, these are the important points. So, pilocytic astrocytoma, children, cystic, not, uh, like, you know, cystic tumor with mural nodule. Cerebellum is affected, BRAF gene fusion with Rosenthal fibers, done. So, what is the next type of a tumor to the astrocytes, the next type of tumor? See, this is a grade 1 tumor, pilocytic astrocytoma, it's a grade 1 tumor, okay, not a big deal. But more dangerous condition is glioblastoma multiforme, okay, glioblastoma multiforme. So this glioblastoma multiforme, I will show you the image also, look here. See, tumor is arising in one lobe, it can even extend into the other lobe, so looking like a butterfly, okay, looking like a butterfly, sir. So, this is also called as a butterfly tumor. It is seen in adults. It is seen in adults. What is the gene mutation? The gene mutation is going to be IDH. Okay, IDH 
gene mutation. Okay, IDH. This IDH gene mutation is going to be seen. How the tumor is going to look like? The tumor is going to look like a butterfly. Okay, so butterfly glioma. This is also called as butterfly glioma. Okay, so why it is looking like a butterfly? It crosses midline. It crosses the midline. So on microscopy, what you will see? On microscopic examination, there is serpentine necrosis. I will show you this serpentine necrosis. Pseudo parasitic tuber cells. Pseudo palisading tumor cells are seen, pseudo parasitic tumor cells are seen, as well as glomeruloid means glomerulus like glomeruloid tumor cells. So, glomeruloid appearance of the tumor cells. So, serpentine necrosis is going to be seen, pseudo parasitic like uh, cells, tumor, pseudo parasitic tumor cells and glomeruloid cells are seen. So, what exactly are these, sir? See, look here, this is the image which I have found. Now, See, this is pseudo palisading. See, the tumor cells are uh, sitting like this. Okay? Just like a wall. Like a wall. So, this is called as pseudo palisading. Okay? Pseudo palisading arrangement. Okay? The parallel arrangement. One, the tumor cell is arranging in parallel. So, parallel arrangement of the tumor nuclei. It's looking like a fence around the house. Okay? It's just looking like a wall or the picket fence. You know the picket fence, right? So, so this is called as a pseudo palisading. Arrangement, okay, pseudo parasitic arrangement. Okay. Now look what you are seeing here. So this is looking like a snake, right? So there is a necrosis. First, what you should know is see the tumor cells are arranging. First, this is a pseudo parasitic arrangement. The tumor cells are arranging like a picket fence. One thing. And there is also necrosis, the central necrosis is happening. So, central necrosis is occurring, now it is in the shape of a snake. So, this is called as a serpentine necrosis. So, pseudo parasitic tumor cells. Next, serpentine necrosis is seen. Okay, serpentine necrosis. And what else, sir? What else you should know is, look, this is the normal glomerulus. Okay, this is the normal glomerulus in the kidney. Normal glomerulus in the kidney. Now, in this condition, see, this is looking like glomerulus, but not glomerulus. Okay, looking like the glomerulus, but not glomerulus. So, this is called as a glomeruloid appearance. So, if a patient is having glioblastoma multiforme, if you take a biopsy in the upper tumor, now there you can see glomeruli like appearance, glomerulus like appearance. Okay, glomerulus like appearance. It is called as glomerulus like appearance, it is called as glomeruloid appearance. So, what are the three important histological features that are seen in glioblastoma multiforme? Serpentine necrosis, pseudo parasitic arrangement of the tumor cells, and glomeruloid tumor cells. Seen in adults, IDH gene mutation. Okay. IDH for isocitrate dehydrogenase gene mutation. Okay. Next. After this, now let's discuss about oligodendroglioma. So I used to remember something like oligodendroglioma starts with the letter O. So I used to remember something like an egg. O like egg. Okay, the O letter is going to show in the uh, like you know appear in the form of an egg, right? So why egg? I will explain to you. First, look at this. The patient is having oligodendroglioma. In oligodendroglioma, which lobe is going to be affected? Which lobe is going to be affected? See, it is the frontal lobe. Okay, the frontal lobe is going to be affected. Just important points, guys. If a patient is having pilocytic astrocytoma, cerebellum, cystic tumor with the mural nodule. If a patient is having glioblastoma multiforme, crosses the midline, crosses the midline, butterfly-like, IDH gene mutation, worst prognosis, bad thing, worst prognosis is going to be seen. Serpentine necrosis, pseudo parasitic tumor cells, glomeruloid tumor cells. Next, here, oligodendroglioma. Oligo, o, o, you should always think about, O means egg. It's looking like an egg. Okay, so why, sir? Because, let me write one by one important points. So, frontal lobe, okay, frontal lobe is going to be affected. What is the gene mutation here? Again, IDH gene mutation. Okay, the most commonly IDH gene mutation can be seen and not only that these patients can also have co-deletion of 1p 19q okay co-deletion of 1p chromosome number 1 pm 19 chromosome number 19 qr okay co-deletion both this this one and this one okay both are deleted now grossly if you look at gross gross morphology grossly you can see calcifications 
So this one brain tumor, which is going to have calcifications. The patient is going to have the calcifications. On microscopic examination, what you will see? The microscopic examination is going to show the fried egg appearance. The fried egg appearance. This is the fried egg, right? The fried egg, just like an omelet. Now, see, this is the fried egg. Okay. Now, see here how the tumor cells are looking like. This, this is the nucleus and this is the cell. So, it's looking like a fried egg. So, fried egg appearance is seen in. Okay, fried egg appearance, it is seen in patients who are having oligodendroglioma. See, fried egg nuclei, oligodendroglioma. Okay. So, oligodendroglioma, frontal lobe is going to be affected. IDH gene mutation and correlation of 1P and 19Q. Grossly, there you can see the calcifications and microscopic examination is going to show fried egg appearance. Okay, fried egg appearance. Now, here itself, I want you to know, which CNS tumors? <laughs> Sorry. Which CNS tumors, okay, which CNS tumors are going to have this calcifications? Calcifications are going to be seen with which type of tumors? CNS tumors. Okay, you already know one thing. See, there is a mnemonic called as a com. Okay, dot com. There is something like dot com, right? Okay. So, see for craniopharyngiomas. Okay, craniopharyngiomas. These are the tumors of uh, rat case pouch, the remnants of the rat case pouch. That, like you know, that I don't want to go into that detail. So, craniopharyngiomas, it, they will undergo calcification. O for, you know it, oligodendroglioma. Okay, oligodendroglioma. O for, you should always remember. O for, that oh, egg. Okay, fried egg appearance. Fried egg appearance. And M for meningioma. Okay, meningioma. So, these are the important points. Okay. Uh, cran uh, craniopharyngioma, oligodendroglioma, and meningioma. In these three conditions, you can see calcifications. Okay, these tumors will undergo calcification. Now, after this, let's discuss about ependymoma. Okay, ependymoma. So, it's a tumor of what? It's a tumor of ependymal cells. Ependymal cells. Now, it's going to be seen in which age group? Children. Okay, children. Okay, so especially, you know the fourth ventricle, right? Now, this is the fourth ventricle. Okay, the fourth ventricle will be something like this. Now, there is a tumor that is occurring. See, these are the lining cells, these are the ependymal cells. Okay, these are the ependymal cells. Now, okay, let me put it like this. First, let me draw the ependymal cells. These are the ependymal cells. This is the fourth ventricle. I hope you know how the fourth ventricle is going to look like. Okay, in the brain stem, there is a fourth ventricle. You know, one of the cell, it have developed the mutations, it have developed the mutations. Now, there is a tumor. Now, what is this? This is the tumor of ependymal cells. So, this is called as ependymoma. Now, what can happen is, from here, some cells will drop. Some cells will drop. Now, this is called as a drop metastasis. So, from here, the cells via the CSF can go into different places. Via CSF, it can come into the spinal cord. Okay. So, this is called as a drop metastasis. So, children, it's seen in fourth ventricle. Okay. But in adults, it's going to be seen in the spinal cord. Spinal cord. It is associated with, associated with which syndrome? So, it's associated with neurofibromatosis type 2. If a patient is having, if a patient is suffering with a neurofibromatosis type 2, he will develop different, different types of tumors. Okay, neurofibromatosis type 2, the patient is going to have different types of tumors. One of the tumor is ependymomas. Okay, so how it's going to look like, sir, under microscopy. Microscopic examination, you are going to see perivascular. Perivascular means around the blood vessel. Perivascular means in the tumor, there are blood vessels. Around the blood vessels, perivascular, pseudorosets. Pseudorosets. Okay, perivascular pseudorosets. Let me show you. See here. Center, blood vessel, perivascular, pseudorosets. Now it's looking like a flower. Okay, now it's looking like a flower, right? So, perivascular pseudorosets. See, here is a blood vessel. The tumor cells are coming and sitting. It's like a flower. So, perivascular pseudorosets are seen in ependymoma. Now, look here. This is a patient who is having, sorry, this is a patient who is having neurofibromatosis type 2. Now, if a patient is having neurofibromatosis type 2, let me write here itself. Neurofibromatosis type 2. These patients, 
are at risk of developing central nervous system tumors. Okay. Which central nervous system tumors you already know? Neurofibromatosis type 2 is associated with ependymomas. Okay, ependymomas are possible. These patients are also going to have meningiomas. Okay, meningiomas means the tumor of the meninges and ependymomas, meningiomas and schwannomas. Okay, so ependymomas, meningiomas and schwannomas can be seen in these patients. Right? Now, here what you are seeing is, just now we have discussed the perivascular pseudorosets. See here, this is the perivascular pseudorosets. Perivascular pseudorosets are seen in which condition? Just now, we have discussed ependymomas, where there is a central blood vessel is present, surrounded by the tumor cells. This is called as perivascular pseudorosets. Already in the topic of a neuroblastoma, in the topic of neuroblastoma, in the endocrine, we have discussed Homer right rosettes are seen in neuroblastoma. Okay, and flexor, Later, you will study this the flexor uh, winter stinner rosettes. Okay, flexor winter stinner rosettes they are seen in retinoblastoma that you will discuss in other subs like you know the future videos. But just for now, I want you to know perivascular pseudo rosettes seen as tumors. Perivascular pseudo rosettes are going to be seen in ependymoma. Drop metastasis is seen in ependymoma. Ependymoma in children seen in fourth ventricle, in adults seen in. Adult seen in spinal cord. Ependymoma is associated with neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay, important points. Next, what are the tumors which will undergo calcification? Com. Com tumors will undergo calcification. Craniopharyngioma, oligodendroglioma, and meningioma. Meningioma. Sir, oligodendroglioma, frontal lobe is going to be affected. Pride egg appearance, IDH gene mutation, okay, and correlation of 1P and 19Q. Grossly, calcifications can be seen. Next, what is this? Glomeruloid appearance, glomeruloid appearance, glomeruloid appearance, pseudo palisading tumor cells, serpentine necrosis, all are seen in glioblastoma multiforme. Okay, it's a tumor of astrocytes, astrocytes, tumor of the astrocytes, glioblastoma multiforme crosses the midline looking like a butterfly. These are the butterfly tumors. Okay, IDH gene mutation again. And the first one, pilocytic astrocytoma, is a cystic nodule, sorry, cystic tumor with a mural nodule, cerebellum. Seen in the children, Rosenthal fibers are microscopy. Okay, so with this, the central nervous system tumors are also completed. I hope the video is helpful. See you tomorrow with the other topics in the central nervous system. Thank you.